Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now that by itself sounds like a great position. Maybe, you know, in the environment that we're in right now, that might sound a little idealistic. But look at the, the way the devil understands the principles of God and tries to, to defund those projects. It says, for there, the place when brethren dwell, to, dwell together in unity, what? There the Lord commands a blessing, life forevermore. And when I was a young Christian, I heard a song called, There is a Place of Commanded Blessing." Wow, what a great way to think of that. Where brethren in unity dwell, he commands it. So we have every reason to fight for this. All right, so the other thing is I told you one of, uh, this is a writer of Hebrews, which I personally believe was Paul, but I know there's some debate about that. But in Hebrews 6, 4 to 5, I, I wrote a partial definition of what it means to be a Christian. It says, those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and who've tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. Okay, that was the title to last week's message, that we can partake of the powers of the age to come. Okay, so we're born into a sinful world. We're born into a place where there's hatred and disrespect shown to people on a regular basis. You don't become perfect when you become a Christian, but at least you get filled with the Spirit of God who is perfect. And then if you can surrender to him and make yourself available to him and say, Lord, I need you to show me how to live in a world that's full of sin and how not to be a sinner, you know, at least not intentionally, to, to, to take matters into my own hands. He said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Right? How can we be more like Jesus in the way we live and interact with each other? If we can do that, we're going to see progress. Without it, I think we're bound to keep repeating the same cycles. So that's why I told you, help me see the genius of Jesus. The, the genius of Jesus is not my phrase. This is something I've heard a couple of other preachers talk about. But what I wanted to do is just try to break it down to us. Because when you think of genius, you think of Albert Einstein maybe or whoever else you might think of. But those people seem a little ethereal and out there and, and out of touch. But part of the genius of Jesus is he takes these really complex situations and he breaks them down and he shows us how to live in them. But we have to spend time with him. We have to study his word. We want to be with other Christians who are mature and seasoned people who've learned how to walk this out in their lives and who are demonstrating fruit. Because here's the truth about the word of God that it shows us that everybody bears fruit in their life. If you're alive, you'll be bearing fruit, but it's either good fruit or bad fruit, all right? There's no way around it. We're all fruit bearing. And he said, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit, right? It's not just trying to confuse you. It's to say, in order to change the fruit in your life, if you don't like the fruit or other people keep reminding you that there's bad fruit in your life, maybe you, you have rage going on in your life that you're not controlling, that's bad fruit. That's a sin, right? If you're out of control like that. Well, how do we get to the root of that thing is we have to ask the Lord, what's the cause of that so that that fruit can go from rage to peace in my life and that I can demonstrate those fruits of being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper instead of allowing myself to get hijacked. So that was his genius. There's plenty of examples. I'm only going to focus on a couple at a high level today, and if we have time, I'll get into one in a little more depth. I do have a clock up here, so I do know what time it is. But you can see there's two lenses there like looking at somebody looking at you through binoculars. And I don't know if every single possible color is represented there, but that's part of the genius of Jesus. He wasn't colorblind. I don't think he wants us to be colorblind. This is feedback that I've gotten from people. No, color's important of who we are. It's part of our identity. We don't want to be blind to it. We want to be sensitive to it. But Jesus was able to cut through all the differences in the way people might have been brought up and, and the different values that they might hold to be able to get the truth into our hearts. And that's what I want. That's what I'm aspiring to. I've, I've asked a lot of the folks in our church that I really respect, who are people of color, if what I'm about to say on any given topic at any given time, not just today, how does it sound to them? How would they translate what I was going to say? Because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I may be doing it because of a lack of knowledge. And, and my, I have changed what I was about to say to people because I refined the message because I want to respect everybody. We should all want to respect people and, and just say, 
you can't walk on eggshells all the time, but at least if we start with a heart of compassion towards people and we say, let's get the message across clearly because, you know, when you offend somebody, their ears shut off. Most of the time, conversation's over. Once they're offended, it's like their heart gets shut down and they start to assume things about you that may or may not be true. So you really do have to be very careful about the language that you're using. So here's the first one, and I called it a courageous prayer. And a lot of you probably know this, this prayer because I already quoted a little bit of it earlier today. But, you know, lots of prayers are courageous. If you say, God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> that takes a lot of courage. John Weber said that's the only prayer that God answers every single time because we all have something wrong with us. And he wants us to ask that question. Just, the good thing is he doesn't bring the whole dump truck and give you everything that's wrong with you all at once. He gives you that thing that's right in that sweet spot, like you're ready to handle it, and you can actually do something about it. And, and similarly, you know, this is an expanded version of that prayer. So it says, verse 23 of Psalm 39, God, this is also the Passion Translation, which you know I'm a fan of. God, I invite your searching gaze into my heart. See why that's a courageous prayer? Some of us are afraid to let him into our heart because we know there's impurities in there. But if you start from a place that he loves you and he doesn't want to punish you, then you don't mind saying this prayer. It's like, okay, I'm inviting your searching gaze to look at my heart. Examine me through and through and find out everything that may be hidden within me. And that's a whole message right there. That takes courage. If it's hidden in me and it's not from you and it's helping to cause bad fruit in my life, I want to know about it. You can't evict something if you don't know it's there. And it's a squatter. It's sitting in you. It's not part of the nature of Christ. And it says, put me to the test and sift through all my anxious cares. See if there's any path of pain that I'm walking on. Mm, thank you, Brian Simmons. Thank you, Brian Simmons. Is there any path of pain that I'm walking on? Could the pain of something that happened to me in the past be impacting me in a wrong way, the way I'm coming across to my brothers and sisters as human beings, brothers and sisters, as other human beings, as other people that are part of humanity that we're supposed to value unconditionally. We're supposed to value them for only the fact that they're made in the image of God. I, I want to know, is there a path of pain I'm walking on? And then lead me back off of that path of pain into your glorious and everlasting ways. The path that brings me back to you. Is there anybody that God wouldn't forgive? Come on, you guys got to feed back a little bit. It's not a trick question. I may give you a trick question, but that wasn't one. <laughs> Everybody's afraid of being wrong, right? So my heart was tilted a little. I'm sorry, I'm just going to use an example, Archie Bunker, okay? Whether you know who that was or not, that was one of the first shows that really dealt with the realities of racism in America. And it was, you know, it was funny, but it was ugly. And, and I'm not saying that we should laugh at it, but it was a way to get behind the, the hearts of people that were dealing with racism that had it and let them see just how ridiculous it was that they would denigrate people just based on the color of their skin. All right? I think it was a net positive. You can argue with me offline if you want. But the way I positioned it is if there's any racism in my heart, then it's like there's an Archie Bunker in there that, that I haven't seen yet because... I haven't looked. I haven't asked the Lord to show me. This prayer says, no, I want you to, I'm inviting your gaze to search my heart and reveal if there's anything in me that's not from you. Are you willing to say that prayer? Yes. All right, good. So they know here. I'm going to stop if they don't answer. <laughs> All right, so in Luke 9, 23, just get ready because this one hurts a little bit, Okay. It says, and he said to the crowd, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. All right, now if we really believe that, we have to realize that's not going to be easy because that means we have to accept the fact that we're on a journey to try to be more like Jesus. And getting there is just as important as arriving there. Get my point? You're not going to be happy when you arrive because you probably aren't going to fully arrive. But you keep moving towards being more Christ-like. Why would he say, take up your cross daily? Because there's always one more thing that he could be working on with us to make us more like him. And instead of being discouraged by that, you should be encouraged by that. 
because he's always open for business. He's always ready to help us deal with that question, what's in my life that's stopping me from being more like you? And racism is clearly the topic of the day right now that has no place in the kingdom of God. Does it exist in the kingdom of God in the churches? It does. It's obvious that it does because we don't never stop sinning. We don't stop sinning completely when we become a Christian. But we should also never stop asking God to show us what we're doing that's not like him. And then, then have the courage to say, you love me. You're my father. I want it out. I want to hate that thing the same way you hate sin. I want to hate that thing in my life so that we start right here. Trisha said it. Or somebody said it today when we prayed. Let judgment begin in the house of the Lord. Let it start with me. Lord. What am I doing wrong that needs to change? 